Bokir Tov, everybody. Good morning, good morning, good morning. David Lang, Shalom. Shalom, Avi. How are you doing, mate? Baruch Hashem, doing good, healthy, family's healthy, trying to enjoy life and keep busy. So tell me, how, how are these Corona days going for you and your family? Well, as you can see, Avi, from the background, I'm really suffering at the moment. Um, it's been terrible. I'm really suffering. No, no, in all seriousness, it's obviously been a hard time for everyone, but you've got to look at the blessings as well. I've been able to spend a lot of time with my kids and we've had some real quality time and I'm enjoying the backyard right now, as you can see in beautiful Eretz Israel, in our homeland. And I just choose not to complain about it. And I just hope everyone's healthy. Everyone watching this is healthy and looking at the blessings uh, that this has brought as well as the really hard times. 100%. First, first of all, I love seeing you in your background. I mean, I love being in my studio, but outdoors is like awesome. So but that's, that's not real? That background's not real? Oh, I wish this was my it? real background, right? I wish. <laughs> fake news, Avi, fake news. <laughs> this, this, is, this is the crazy thing. I'm not even in the office. I haven't been, to the, been back to the office since Corona started and we were, the regulations came down about not leaving your home. But I brought, I brought my studio here. So there's a tiny room in the house. This is the playroom. And it, all of a sudden, it turns into uh, the beautiful scene of the Temple Mount, the holiest place of the Jewish people. What can you do? But uh, yeah, no, but what you said in terms of Corona, that uh, look, 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 take advantage of the blessings and in addition to, to, the, to, to the bad aspects. Yeah, that, that's life, taking advantage of, you know more than most of us, life throws you lemons and sometimes really sour lemons and it's our challenge to turn it into lemonade, no matter how hard and how sad it is. So you're, I mean, I, I don't have to tell that to you. You could talk about that more than me. I mean, I could, but uh, I well, mean, we're not a going lot of there issues now. we could talk about, yeah. Um, but look, first of all, Avi, we should just mention to the viewers out there that this is the start of a beautiful uh, series, hopefully. This isn't just a one-off thing. Um, this is hopefully a weekly thing that we're going to do. We've discussed it for a long, long time. And then Corona came and put our plans on hold. But uh, you've decided, hey, Corona's not going to get in our way. So well, what's, this, what's this show called, Avi? Please tell me. It's the Avi and Aussie show. Aussie, Aussie, Aussie. That's right, of course. Avi and Aussie. I think it's got a nice ring to it, my friend. It's like Aussie and Harriet, if you re remember that. That's going back you know, to the 50s you or something. <laughs> you know why it's good we why it's good for me um uh, dave because sometimes I, i'm a little too serious i deal with a lot of serious issues all the time you do as well but you've got a nice sense of humor to you I, i'm not a funny guy but i like being with funny people so you bring out the funny side of me so that's good i like that i like that uh yin, yin and yang well, aspect uh, well, for, well first of all um I, I, it's a pleasure to be a yang to your yin whatever that means. Um, and secondly, you're pretty funny, but I think that your trademark, Avi, is being one of the nicest people I've ever met. And I'm saying that in all sincerity. And I think anyone that watches you and follows you and just knows it, you've got a joy in life that I think all of us uh, can take something from. And it actually inspires me. So, Avi, I appreciate your friendship. Um, but let's get the funny on, you know, let's start with the funny. And, and the serious, of course. Let's go. Let's let's go. You know what? And, and the truth is, and and and, and I, I, we're going to talk about some of the some of the issues that you've had your eye on lately, and you've written about. And again, you bring up very serious issues, but the it's a comedy of him itself because everything you bring up is the hypocrisy of the reporting and and the and the attention that haters out there give Israel and that leaders and media give Israel. And it's a comedy of it of itself. And you give it a wonderful spin showing how comedic it really is. I mean, uh, the, it, let's go into one of the latest things you just talk about. Um, you want to bring it up yourself in terms of how Israel dealt with malaria. All of a sudden we're being attacked for how the Jewish people, this is before the state of Israel, dealt with taking care of malaria here in the mandate of Palestine. And obviously we were horrible to the to the indigenous Palestinians and our taking care of malaria was all about harming them. So let's go to the that comedy act because you did a fabulous piece yeah. on that. 
Yeah, thank you, Avi. And it's a really comedy of the absurd, if I can put it that way. So why did I bring this up? Because there was a human rights report that came out uh, yesterday or the day before. And basically, whatever, there's too much to unpack in this and we can go through it in subsequent uh, videos and shows. But one thing that caught my, 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 my eye was the fact that they criticized Israel. They, there was a little paragraph or actually even a line saying how the Zionist settlers of the time drained the swamps pushing away or, you know, to make way for their towns. And it sort of interrupted the, I think, the herding of the native Palestinians, something along those lines. I mean, we can link to it afterwards. I'm not, my, my photographic memory isn't what it used to be, but it's something along those lines. So I'm like, wait a minute, this just looks rotten to the core. So, you know, one of the things I love doing, Avi, is research. You know, I do a lot of things on, on my website. But one of the things I really love, you know, gives me a lot of satisfaction, intellectual satisfaction, is to take a topic and really deep dive into it. And so I deep dive, dove into this and I found, I came up, you know, pretty quickly, I found an academic paper from the American entomologist. That's a very hard word, by the way. I don't know if I pronounce it well, yeah. uh, but I think people get the idea. An academic paper from 2017, which only was dealing with malaria, okay? It had no dog in the race, in the fight. It really was just interested in malaria and it saw that what the Jewish people did, at, you know, in the early 20th century in Palestine, or what was then called Palestine, by the way, I can call it Palestine, I shouldn't even do that. It was called British Mandate Palestine. That doesn't prove anything. That's another topic for another show and I know you've done this a lot. It's really not a dirty word. It was British Mandate Palestine. Right. Look, anyway, so you basically, were Palestinians under the British Mandate of Palestine. It totally exactly. We were it. called absolutely. Anyway, I'm getting a bit Talmudically sidetracked. Uh, okay, so basically, what they were saying is, uh, so so this this academic paper was showing how we brought in some methods to deal with malaria so great so effective not just to the entire land it didn't just help the jewish people it, it specifically says in this paper how it benefited the arab population by the way we'll get into, they call it the, you know the arabs they didn't call exactly. it and we'll get into that in a minute but the palestinian identity was even addressed in this academic paper which is amazing again nothing to do with the middle east conflict it's just an objective academic paper about malaria and they wanted to take the lessons from our fighting malaria in the early 20th century and apply it to Africa. Right. And that was the sort of the, the thesis of this paper. But what there were so many gems in it. And you know, as I'm reading, I'm going, oh my God, this is gold. You know, sometimes you, you approach a post and you, you don't know where it's gonna get you. It could be a bit of a hit and miss approach uh, affair. Um, in this case, it's just the deeper I dove and the more I read, I'm like, holy, wow. you know what? Uh, this is amazing stuff. I've never right. seen this before. And um, so basically, yeah. And not only that, it was effective for the Arab population, but it, sh it, it went into the methods. I don't want to bore everyone to death with the methods. You can read the post after this, but the toughness, um, the, it, the approach was about, you know, there were so many language barriers at the time between the populations, you know, the Muslims and the Arabs, uh, you know, with Arabic and the Jews, with Yiddish, it was, you know, Hebrew was only just starting to come back. Thanks, Elia, Elia Ben Yehuda. Um, but basically it was all about educating the population. And, and this uh, academic paper goes into the lens that this Jewish professor, Kligler, I think his name was, and everyone uh, around him were going to educate the population which includes the Arabs, right. and they were on board with this. In other words, when we drained the swamps, unlike what Human Rights Watch are claiming, that we somehow came in, bulldozed everything, drained the swamps because we wanted more cities just for ourselves, and these poor Palestinians who were fine with these swamps, apparently the, you know, their, their blood wasn't sweet enough, the, they were unaffected by the, the uh, mosquitoes, miraculously, uh, you know, just herding their, whatever, their animals, um, we came in and did all that. No, this academic paper, again, it's an objective source. Most academic papers are actually rubbishing us, unfortunately, because they've got an agenda-driven focus. But this is just about malaria. It's a scientific paper. And um, it, Human Rights Watch should be absolutely ashamed of themselves. And by the way, this is one sentence. I'm going to go back to that freaking report 
Am I allowed to say Fricken? I think I think so. Um, I'm going to go back to that report, and I'm going to I'll probably find a bunch of other stuff. But this is just one line. Can you imagine the amount of lines in this report? I mean, you probably looked at it and you can already tell the audience how many lines are in this report. Oh, it's it's crazy. And again, this is something we see day after day. And again, it goes back to to my line, always saying Israel is the solution, not the problem. And back then, here, this paper of 2017 goes back and sees how the way the Jewish people, it wasn't the state of Israel yet, the way the Jewish people dealt with getting rid of malaria. This was in a malaria infested area of the world. Everyone stayed away. I mean, one of the pieces of information from that report was that the Turkish, the Turkish Empire had soldiers um, at Rosh Hanikra, on, on the border between Syria, uh, Syria Lebanon, and, and, and Israel, for those who understand, right? And they used to switch the soldiers every 10 days or every two weeks because they used to all get malaria within that first week. So they always had to switch yeah. soldiers. It was known this place was infested with malaria. The, Tur the Ottoman Empire didn't do a thing. They didn't do a thing to help, not their soldiers, not the Jews, not the Arabs, not, the, not anyone. And who helped get rid of malaria? It was the Jews. And it helped everyone. So this report, 2017, it ends up saying, yeah, the Jews did something and they, ha they helped the world. Still today, we're able to learn what the Jews did with malaria and the mandate of Palestine to apply those lessons in Africa. And then you have Human Rights Watch destroying Israel because we took care of malaria in order to harm the Arabs and take over their land. Yes. Well said, Avi. And the other thing I didn't mention, but I alluded to, and I said we'd get back to it, is the fact that in this report, they deal with the Palestinian identity. It's sort of almost like a segue in this academic paper where they're saying, it's just, it's just facts. Again, they don't have a dog in the race. And they're talking about the fact that the people, the Arabs that were in the land came from Egypt, some came from Egypt, all these different Arab lands, they settled here. And they even mention, and again, I don't want to sort of uh, misquote this, but I'm paraphrasing, that the Palestinian identity was an artificial construct. This is in an academic paper from 2017. It's amazing stuff, Avi. It's amazing stuff. And it's, I sort of almost stumbled upon it. And I just want, I want to shout it out to the world right now. Yeah, keep, keep on breaking that down. And you know, one of the biggest proofs I bring to the, to, to the table always in terms of showing like there is no such thing as a Palestinian people. I just go back, because what do they all bring up? They go, oh, the, um, the, the, the partition plan, right? The, the United Nations partition plan it said that there was supposed to be a Jewish state and a Palestinian state, right? Guess yes. what? And people don't know this. The partition plan does not use the term Palestine or Palestinian exactly. to define the Arabs. It said a Jewish state and an Arab state. There is no exactly. Palestinian entity, even in the United Nations partition plan of 1947. It was all made up, all made up. And it's all used to, I mean, I, I use it like this, because I like to say this, the Romans, the Romans created the term Palestine when they destroyed the kingdom of Judea 2000 years ago in order to erase the Jewish identity of uh, that we existed at all. And it's being used again today. And then I take a jump and I say, as a Judean Samarian Jew, I go, the term West Bank also is introduced and used today for the same exact reason, in order to erase the yeah. Jewish identity and connection to our homeland. So nothing's changed, nothing, except today we can laugh about it. And we have all this information to, and like you do, to put out there for people to Use their, use their noodle and say, wait a second, we're being lied to on a massive scale and all the facts are right there out there in front of us. So keep, keep on bringing out those pearls of wisdom from these reports that you're finding because it's, uh, it's, it's eye-opening for those who, really, who are really intellectually honest with themselves. That's yeah, we need, we need more people to be intellectually honest with themselves and use their noodles. We need more noodle users out there. Exactly. I mean, that's what we need because unfortunately there are too many sheep and they basically take things which are delivered to them in an easy way. They don't want to do the research. They don't necessarily want to read an article that does the research. But everyone that is interested in this needs to really get the facts right. Because this is a complete 180 on the truth. Notice how I said 180, not 360, like uh, 
His 360 uh, just brings you right back to the place where you started. <laughs> there was uh, Abbas Hamadir. He's a very anti-Semitic guy on Twitter and Facebook. He's the guy that um, he posted with Rashida Tlaib in her office after she went into Congress with a map of Palestine and she, you know, the kefir. Oh no, sorry, it was with a painting of her with the Capitol building with a kefir on it. He's a very evil person. And yeah, he said the other day something about a 360. And we all basically laughed at that because if you do a 360, you're right back where you started. No, this is a 180. <laughs> nice. So, so let, I want to jump to something else that you, that you brought up um, sure. before, before we went live that, uh, and this is another person that abuses the truth. You're one of the leaders, if not what, of, of uh, Jewish voices for peace. You, you said that you just wrote something that she is being attacked by her own partners of Israel haters. Can you go into why the, 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 the yes. sister of Jewish uh, JVP yeah. is being attacked by her own? Yeah, sure. So to Rebecca Wilkerson, if I'm pronouncing that wrong, no apologies to her. I, I, you know, I don't have to apologize for that. She, uh, you know, basically distorts a lot of things. I'll distort her name if I want to. Uh, but it in all seriousness. So, yeah, so her husband... Um, who, by the way, doesn't go by, doesn't use the same surname. So that raises another question, whether she uses her maiden name deliberately to dissociate herself from this person. I forget his name. It's Yoni someone, not Wilkerson. And he works for Checkpoint Software, which is one of the flagship startup nation, as you know, uh, company success stories, checkpoints going back what 20 years? Yeah, I think uh, it's a cyber security. The first, the first major uh, Israeli startup success story, like really the first. Yeah, I think. right, right, exactly. So, and not only that, cyber security before cyber security was even a thing. Cyber right. security is one of the hot topics in the world of tech. This is, you know, the basically the beginnings of cyber security. And so, he he's a senior role. We're not talking about the janitor, of course. You know, he's, he's got a senior role. You can see that on LinkedIn. Um, I've also done a post on it. And he's got a senior role. And not only that, he actually also, she, you know, she'll post on Twitter when he goes to a rally castigating the government. I think he shares much of her politics. Um, you know, very anti-Israel politics. But, you know, he's, he's, he is very happy to be getting his Parnassah, his income from one of the flagship Israeli companies. Now, why is this relevant? Because she is a very huge proponent of BDS. And if you go to the JBP, the Jewish Voice for Peace website, they've got a whole section on BDS, right. Boycott Divestment Sanctions. So, you know, don't just talk the talk, walk the walk. Now, it's okay for me to say that. And I think this knowledge has been out there for years. But I noticed this week that she was being attacked by some of the people on her side saying, well, wait a minute, you know, you're a hypocrite. And that always, you know, that's the time uh, to take out the popcorn. I mean, right. I'm not going to apologize for that. I revel in this stuff. Right. I love when they turn on themselves. You know, when Fatah and Hamas are fighting each other to the death, I'm, 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 I'm there by the computer screen with my popcorn. I mean, this is, it's great stuff. It's great stuff. So I think this was something, this is something I brought up this week, you know, because my philosophy, the way that I do things, I'm sort of a bit in your face, as you know. Right. And I think that's okay. I, I want to make these people uncomfortable. I want to mock them. I want to deride them. I want to be on the attack. I, I don't think we need to apologize. We're the proud Jews living in our homeland. And we don't always have to be on the defense. We have nothing to be on the defense about. 100%. We have truth on our side. We have everything on our side. And you know what? We can fight back. And leg legally and effectively, and that's what I try to do. Humor, mockery, derision, these are all tools. And, you know, not everyone is comfortable using them. That's fine. Some of us are. Some, like you, use joy and facts and other tools, and which are just as effective. Right. We're all part of the same team, and we have to play to our strengths. Right. So... Right. Yeah. No, and uh, again, uh, I guess one of the reasons, I mean, I, 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 like you, I've been following uh, Israel news years. I, I mean, I remember when, when uh, I first made Aliyah to Israel in 1990, all right? Pre-internet, wow. pre-email, all those years, right? Pre-Gulf War. Free what? Pre-Gulf War. Pre-Gulf War, yeah, we came a long time ago. War. And I remember reading Jerusalem Post articles or whatever articles, and then writing letters to my friends back in the States. 
saying, guys, don't believe this. This isn't true. This didn't happen. It's not like this and whatever. I, I, this is back in 1990. And always being frustrated for decades how the, the official Israeli uh, response to everything was always defensive. And I think the, one of the biggest things that the internet and social media gave us, the proud Jews, was basically, we don't have to rely on official, and again, the official Israeli, Israel uh, line has changed dramatically also. But even years ago, even 10 years ago, when we got started on the internet, it allowed us to stand up and go on the offensive and provide the truth and not have to rely on the defense anymore. And that's so important. And in, in dealing with the JVP person, I mean, one of, again, another message that I'm always putting out there is the first people who will be attacked by the growing um, anti-Israel, anti-Jewish movement in y- Europe or America, it's not just the religious. It's also going to be the liberal partners, or not liberal, the progressive partners. They, they're deluding themselves into thinking they're partners. But they're not. They're, they're, they're useful idiots being used because yes. of their as a Jew agenda. But the second they don't cross, they cross a line like this woman because she's married to someone who works for an Israeli company, they throw her under the bus. She could wave her flag. No, I'm anti Israel. They don't care. They got you. Your husband works for an Israeli company. All your bona fides of your anti Israel activity is thrown out the window. And they don't well, get it. And, I, and my call out to my 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 fellow Jews, progressives, is wake up. You're gonna be the first one on the chopping block. I'm looking after your tochis, not just my own. So <laughs> wake up. You're deluding yourself. It's so true, Avi. You hit it on the head. And one of the, my favorite expressions that I use a lot is someone is not the sharpest tool in the shed, but they're a tool nonetheless. And this is what I say about these people. And you saw it with Ariel Gold from Code Pink as well. I mentioned this Abbas Hamadi guy, uh, this violent anti-Semite. So she, I've even, I don't even know what she said. She said something and he started attacking her because he, she wasn't anti-Israel enough. She's a Jewish person, hates Israel to the core. Although she sends her kids to Zionist camps. That's another story for a different show. I've got dirt on everyone, trust me. Uh, but yeah, you're right. They're useful tools. And, uh, but they, they will be turned on because that the Jew haters of the world hate Jews and you might be one of the good Jews okay they hate the bad Jews but they hate the good Jews as well oh sorry the the good Jews okay the ones that they say are the good Jews but the minute that they step out of line out of goose step can I call it (laughs) when they go out of goose step then um, they will be attacked exactly and these people I they need to you know I would almost feel sorry for them, but they're doing a lot of these Jewish people, Jewish. They're, right. they're halachically Jewish. Okay, I'm not, I'm not going to cast aspersions on their halachic status, their Jewish law status, but Jewish in terms of what Judaism means to them. Because right. no proud, self-respecting Jew cannot love Israel. It's just every halacha in the book, okay? Shemitah, whatever you... Everything, we're in the Omer right now, Avi, you know that. The seven yeah. weeks from Pesach to Shavuot. Oh, I know it. I just Every came festival. for the first time. Thanks a lot, Bolmer. Oh, I oh, feel better. I'm so happy. I'm, by the way, as an aside, I'm getting a haircut this afternoon. Uh, it's been a while. There we go. Yeah, yeah. I'm, 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 I, I had to almost uh, build a new room into my house just to accommodate my hair. <laughs> but yeah, you, I mean, I'm preaching to convert it uh, here, Abby, and I'm sure most of your, if not all of your, uh, or our viewers uh, would agree with it. But it's important to say. That's it's it's you cannot be a proud Jew without loving with all your heart Israel. It's just they go hand in hand. I'm sorry, it's just so clear. 100%. So don't you know, if people say they're proud Jews, they're not. They're what I call schmecky Jews. You know what I mean by schmecky? They're yeah. cowering in the corner trying to appease people that really don't matter. Bad people who don't matter to us. And, you know, the people that matter to us, we have so many allies in the world who are not Jewish. Right. I want to say it now. It's not all about the Jews against everyone else. No. You know this. We have so many amazing allies. It's about God-fearing people. It's about good people in the world. Of any persuasion, Jewish, Christian, and Muslim. We have so many Muslim allies who are really good, decent people 
that don't that that are absolutely appalled by what's been done in the name of their religion and that's important to say this isn't a uh it's about good people against bad people it's not about, about jews against the world and there's a lot of good people but there's a lot of bad people unfortunately 100 percent. and just just going back to 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 the identity or the jewish identity of this jvp person and and her ilk and uh, unfortunately there are plenty of them in the jewish yeah. community um uh, i was at a conference a number of months ago obviously before corona and uh it, it was about dealing with uh with, with um, anti anti-semites the growing anti-semitism and anti-israel activism on college campuses etc trying to give tools and information to to activists on campuses etc cetera, etc cetera. one of the topics that came up was zionism and anti-zionism and uh I, I made a comment there that to me was rudimentary was like basic and it made such a wave of impression on people who were there. I was shocked. All I said was Zionism, put aside the modern political movement called Zionism. That, that exists, all right? But Z that's not Zionism. Zionism existed for thousands of years. Zion is Jerusalem. Zionism, Zion is a part of our Jewish identity. And then I went on to say, everything you're talking about here at this conference, no one's talking about that. That's the most important piece of information to give over to our Jewish students on campus. It's not about whether you're for or against the political movement. You could agree with any government you want. Plenty of Americans disagree with American government policy. Doesn't mean that all of a sudden you're against the country and want it to be destroyed. So how all of a sudden are you going against your own identity as a Jew? Understand Zionism is supposed to be part of your identity. And all of a sudden, I heard other people then talking about it in other sessions. Last night, someone said Zionism is part of your Jewish identity. Why aren't you talking about that on your college campuses with your students? And it comes to, uh, well, the reason I'm bringing this up in connection to, to the JVP leader is because last week, was it JVP? Was it the, uh, the, I think it was JVP, a TikTok video. You saw that video of the girl putting down like her- oh, yeah, I, posted, I posted about it. I right? posted so go, about it, yeah. So you talked about it before. Mocking Judaism. Exactly. It was 10 things saying you could be Jewish and then listing 10 things that had everything to do with being a Jew. So you could be Jewish, but you, you, you're you not proud about anything that has to do with your Jewish identity. And that's exactly their problem. Yeah. They yeah. have nothing to do with their Jewish it's identity. So true, Avi. Yeah. And they're so full of contradictions, Avi. You reminded me of something that every year for Pesach, they do, JVP does what's called a liberation Seder, where they co-opt the Pesach Seder. Now, if you go through the Pesach Seder, first of all, the whole reason for Pesach has, is intrinsically attached to moving to the land of Israel. Yeah. That's the whole thing. That's the, the Haggadah. The Haggadah is the story. We were slaves in Egypt. Why were we slaves in Egypt? Why did Hashem, God, put us in Egypt? It was to get to the land of Israel, to give us the Torah. Not only that, in the Haggadah, if you read the Haggadah, these people don't, <laughs> apparently. Right, the Shana Bab Yushalayim. That's at the end of the Haggadah, right before Haggadah, which is also very important. It's a different topic. Uh, we got a lot but, of different uh, topics to talk it's, about. There's the, a the cognitive dissonance. The Haggadah. These people should never bring up Pesach. If I was them, if I was an advisor to JBP and these Israel haters, I would never bring up Pesach. Seriously, out of all the festivals besides Shavuot. <laughs> Pesach is the one that's like, whoa, it's all yeah. about going to Israel, about the land of Israel, about being next year in Jerusalem, about sacrificing in the temple. Come on. I'm you can't up the other one. be Jewish and not acknowledge that. Right. And this is, as you said, Avi, you're 100% right. Way before the 20th century or the 19th century new Zionist movement. Zionism is a new strain. The, what's called Zionism now is a new strain of the Zionism of the Torah. Okay, just like anti-Zionism is a new strain of anti-Semitism. Let's yeah. talk strains. We're in the, in the era of coronavirus. These are different strains of the same thing. Correct, correct. And I'll, uh, in, in addition to Passover, which you are 100% correct, you got, I mean, it makes, I don't know whether to laugh or cry when I see all the holiday messages from the Israel haters, the Jewish Israel haters, as well as the anti-Semitic non-Jewish Israel haters like Rashida Tlaib and, and Elon Omar. With the, with, with the chalot. Right. With the chalot. 
Right. And, it's a lot for Pesach, yeah. <laughs> and then, right, and, and then the other holiday that they also kill it is Hanukkah. Hanukkah, oh. the, the holiday of Jewish liberation in the oh, hills God. of Judea and Samaria. In the hills Not of just Judea that. and Samaria. It was... It was a military victory. It was everything they're against. You know, they, they claim to be a bit of peace and not using military force. Hanukkah was about might to reclaim, the, the rededicate the temple in Jerusalem. Right. You're right, Avi. I didn't even think about that. Hanukkah yeah, those is two, also those, one of Those two holiday messages for those holidays just kills oh. me every year. Just the, so what, yeah. But when you think about it, all right, I'm gonna stick with the Jews. Cause like, I, I, I care about all people. But my, my ultimate care is trying to bring Jews to be proud of their Jewish identity. I don't care how religious or not religious. I don't care. I want you to be a no proud problem. Jew connected to your, exactly. heritage, your culture, right? So what, what, what it comes down to, I believe, is that all these anti-Israel Jews, they are the ones who've decided that for them, their Jewish identity has nothing to do with the particularistic aspects of their Jewish identity. It's them converting Jewish values to be universalist, universal, universal, right? They don't Absolutely. want, they, they, they run away like the plague from ever trying to be the particular Jew and what it means to, to, to be a Jew and the Jewish identity. That's it. They're running away from it like the plague. 100%. They just translate, Abby. oh, Jewish yeah. values are universal. So these holidays are about universal values, but has nothing to do with the actual truth of our heritage, of our history, of our Absolutely. true identity. That's what it comes down to. Ab Absolutely. And you know what, Avi? They are religious people, meaning they have a religion, but their religion is liberalism. And even that, they co-opt what it means to be a liberal. It's not really being a liberal. Because right. they're in bed with these they're anti-liberal. They're the most anti-liberal. Uh, totalitarian people. Yeah, exactly. It's 100%. They've, they've taken, they've gone, they've shied away from Judaism and they found a new religion, which is liberalism, but in inverted commas. Right. And it's very sad because as much as I point out, I mock, deride, fight them, I'm not like the sort of person that would be like, you know what, screw you. They, they're fellow Jews and I hope one day they see the error of their ways and they come back because we should feel a responsibility to every Jew. And it actually makes me sad, even though maybe my persona is that I don't care. I actually do care. But the way to fight it, I'm hoping that by fighting their lies, eventually they will come to see the light. Because unfortunately, when I've tried the more gentle approach, it doesn't, it doesn't work. Yeah, no, <laughs> That's just in my just, experience. Yeah, I think for most of them, 99.9% .9 of them, it, it's going to be the reality of life smacks them in the face for them and to stop. And it's a patron tuchus, as they say. A patron exactly. Tuchus. And, it's, and it's going to be, and again, this is the way I see my role as well, is by putting, I don't want to shame them. I want to put the information out there so that they can go back. You know, once upon a time I heard this, let me look this up again. And all of a sudden be, open up their minds to be intellectually honest. Because right now all those, all those leftists are not intellectually honest. They are useful no. idiots. They don't think for themselves. They just swallow the sound bites, the anti-Israel, anti-Jewish sound bites, and they go walk around proudly like, as a Jew. Israel's horrible. As a Jew, occupation. As a Jew, Palestinian. Yada yada yada. They don't know a thing, and they're not intellectually honest to have an honest conversation to even deal with potentially hearing that. Ooh, maybe there's other information out there that I didn't know about. Let me rethink things. No, I, you and me, I, we're open to having conversations with anybody. We're more liberal than the so-called liberals who are anti-liberal because they shut down conversations. Absolutely. So it's about I us completely agree with that information yeah. out there ready for when one of them are gets smacked in the face, forgets a tochus, gets smacked in the tochus and wakes up and is then open to opens their mind to be able to delve into that information. Yeah. That's I mean we're definitely um you know swimming against the tide because they've been they're being educated in the diet of uh, anti-Israel sentiment in their colleges in the US, especially also in Europe to some extent. And it's almost become cool, you know, with this whole intersectionality movement, which has actually precluded Jews from being part of it. You know, Jews are not white. OK, I had to break it to all those out there that think Jews are white. I mean, look at me. I'm very white when it comes to physical uh, characteristics, but we're not white. We're indigenous to this land. 
It's, it's thousands of years of diaspora, okay? That's the history books. No one can deny that. But we're not white people. But when it comes to the intersectionality movement, we're white, white privileged people. Why? Because they think that, you know, most Jews are quite privileged in terms of the socioeconomic uh, situation. And you know what? That's probably true. Not everyone. But you know why it's true, Avi? say something a bit controversial maybe people would say why are you saying this uh that's true because it says in the torah that hashem is going to bless us that's it that's why there are a lot of jews who are successful not because they're such smart people and on the you know i mean yeah they do work hard but it's all prophesized and um you know anti-semitism is also god's will Anti-Semitism, I believe, I know we're you know, going to a lot of topics here, and we, we, this is why we need a weekly show, Avi, because we could talk for hours. Uh, but you know, anti-Semitism, I believe, has a purpose, and that is to keep the Jews together. Because if things got too comfortable, we would intermarry, we would assimilate, and that would be the end. Right. We'll, we'll talk about God TV in another, <laughs> in another show, you you know, the proselytizing but, that's going on. There's a lot following, to up, unpack. following up on your anti-Semitism point, they, they is also, I actually had a conversation with Elon Carr, right? The anti-Semitism yes. czar oh, wow. of the Trump administration. Yeah. And yeah. I actually talked to him about this. And I said, and I, I, I right, it, was at, it was also at this conference. And I, I said the following, and I asked for the people on the panel if they agreed or disagreed. I said, listen, anti-Semitism always was and always will be. It's not about fighting anti-Semitism. It's about preparing the Jews to deal and how to live as best as possible in a world of anti-Semitism and growing anti-Semitism. Like it's never going to go away. And then I said the following. Every like dollar that. donated to fight anti-Semitism is a wasted dollar because it's not going to work. You, you failed even with taking, uh, putting your hands in your pocket. It's, it's failed to, 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 to fail. You can't, you can't fight anti-Semitism. But what you can do is invest that uh, money yeah. to... In, in Jewish education and in Jewish pride so that our generation of younger Jews can be better prepared to live in a world of, uh, of anti-Semitism. And he said he agreed, which was one, which was what was, I was, I, I didn't really know to be before yeah. that. Now I do, right. Yeah, no, I mean, I do say that I fight anti-Semitism. I mean, I do that from a Saman point of view, but I take on what you're saying. But what I mean by that is whenever I fight anti-Semitism, whenever I'm dealing with anti-Semitic things on Facebook or social media, I'm actually doing it for the, the benefit, not of the anti-Semites. I'm throwing them under the bus. I don't care what happens to the anti-Semites, okay? I'm doing it for the, the people on the fence, the people who are intellectually honest, as you said before, uh, you know, exposing the lies, exposing the hate, the, the disgusting sentiments. But it's so I guess, I'm, I guess you're right. It's not really fighting anti-Semitism. It's exposing no, anti right, no. and I'm strengthening Jewish identity. Right. No, I'm you're referring right. more. Yeah. I'm referring more to fighting anti-Semitism by more educational programs about the Holocaust and more Holocaust museums and more Holocaust memorials because that's where a lot of these organizations are throwing all their money. Oh, we have to educate more about the Holocaust. No, you don't. People either want to know about the Holocaust or not all about Holocaust. either it's in their history books or it's not in their history books. So just because they know about the Holocaust is not going to meet, make, mean people all of a sudden are going to be less anti-Semitic. We live in a generation right. where even if so many people don't know about the Holocaust, many people do. And today, many of the Israel haters say that the Jews abuse the Holocaust in order to get sympathy from the world, in order for us to get sympathy for Israel. We're being attacked specifically because of our because how we harp on the Holocaust. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't talk about the Holocaust. Of course we should. But all these programs about more Holocaust education and more Holocaust memorials and more Holocaust museums, and that's the way to fight anti-Semitism, that's a waste of dollar. That, that's what I'm, in terms of fighting people online and calling them out and providing truth so that people can wake up and be able to call out the anti-Semites, no, for sure, that, that's definitely what we have to do. Yeah, I mean, you know, you've spoken probably about this. You know what I feel about the funding of different big organizations and where I think that money would be better spent. We've discussed that, we've discussed it again, but like I'll say now that I think that people who are in the grassroots that are effectively dealing with this on a daily basis know the climate, know what's effective. I won't mention any names, but perhaps there are two faces on this particular video that might know something about it. 
that you know instead of uh, the government uh, ministries putting a lot of money to a government ministry to then put up nice graphics on Facebook and uh, links to articles from those that are actually doing the dirty work, then perhaps uh, the money would be spent that way. But I would never mention that because you know I wouldn't want to offend anyone. You know, I want to ask you an opinion about something, actually, in connection to we were talking about uh, the youth and, and, and college students and, and so many being turned to be anti-Israel. Um, did you see the, the, uh, the a report that was recently published, I think last week, showing that the older American Jews get the less anti, the, the more the more pro-Israel they become? Did you see that report? I, I did not. I cannot lie. Okay, so I was going to ask what you thought about it. I thought that was really interesting because it does. It, I, I I saw the headline of the report. I didn't I didn't read the details, but the premise is that even though today majority of Jewish college students are anti-Israel, as they grow up and become uh, part of real life, many of them stop being anti-Israel and start being pro-Israel which I would love for that to be true. I, I don't know how true that is. I don't know how the data was, was done, but it was surprising to see uh, to see that. So I was just gonna ask you about that. Yeah, I mean, I didn't see them. I'll look into it. And I, I, it's not that surprising to me because actually, as I mentioned before, you have these college students who are being indoctrinated and they're being taught, you know, even in the English class, you know, Noam Chomsky, what's he a professor of, I mean? Is he a professor of the Middle East? Is linguistics, right? Something like linguistics. But he's one of the biggest anti semitic professors out there that the anti-Semites love. You know, it's a useful tool as we spoke about before. So um, I can imagine that, you know, with wisdom, with life experience, with being exposed to different things that over time, uh, hopefully the more mature one gets and that they, you know, look, the Palestinian wars is one of the biggest frauds ever in history. Okay, not just the... 20 in the 21st centuries. Okay, I'm gonna say that right now. I don't care what anyone thinks uh, about me saying this. This is true, I'm honest. I'm always yeah. gonna be honest. I don't hate anyone. It is. I'm a student of history, I my research. It's a huge fraud. It's a huge fraud. Okay, and I think, you know, if anyone is intellectually honest, that the truth will come out. We have the truth on our side. It's just as simple as that, Abby. Look, Without going into the Torah and religion, and you know, the, the, these are my beliefs and your beliefs, many of our beliefs. But when I'm an advocate, I'm, I don't have to argue that, you know, in terms of trying to influence other people that don't believe in it. Sometimes you have to put that aside in terms of your, your advocacy, just based on pure logic and just historical truth and morals. You have to support Israel and you cannot support this terrorist entity. I'm sorry, I don't get it. And one of, anyone one of that my, does, yeah, sorry. No, 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 great. I mean, one of my uh, favorite sound bites, I mean, again, so many times there's just so much to unpack in order to get the truth out there. But one of my favorite sound bites that says it all is a true liberal supports Israel. Yeah. So, I mean, I actually had a very interesting one of the things I've been doing during this coronavirus. Um, is doing more video interviews with people. I never used to do that. I mean, you're one of the one of my friends I think that the coronavirus hasn't really affected from the point of view of your vocation. Right now, you're putting out a lot of videos. Oh, wait a minute. What was Avi Abela doing before the coronavirus? <laughs> you're back to a lot of videos. Maybe you yeah. Zoom more often, but you're doing the same thing. Right. God bless you. But it's something that I've kind of done more. You know, I was sort of putting it off for a long time. I was anonymous, as we discussed in the previous show. And now I've sort of been forced, you know, being at home, going a bit so crazy to just go ahead and do it. So one of the fascinating people that I interviewed um, a couple of weeks ago was Mark Pellegrino. He's a Hollywood actor. He's very ubiquitous. He's been in all sorts of stuff. He might have a name that many of you may not, um, you know, recognize, like De Niro has been many many shows like you know supernatural lost dexter uh, 13 reasons why you know a lot of the millennials will know about him even the big lebowski which is my personal favorite of a movie and i interviewed him and this guy is amazing first of all as a hollywood actor um dare i say it's a hollywood actor that uses their brain and is highly intelligent and articulate it's not the norm you know you have one boy you have a few others but it's not the norm 
okay? Um, but the fascinating thing about that, that interview was that he, he's an atheist. He doesn't believe in God. Of course, we do, and that's a big uh, difference between us, but he loves Israel. From a purely, uh, from a purely, you know, his whole uh, thing is that Israel gives rights to people. They're a moral state. He doesn't take morality from an objective God-given morality, but just using common sense. He's an objectivist, you know, Ayn Rand. He believes in that philosophy. We don't have to go into it now, but he just says Israel is a, a light. Now, to have a person who doesn't even believe in God, but so high profile and defends Israel, that's an amazing thing. I mean, I found it amazing. You know, it's one thing for a religious person to do that. Right. Not yeah, I mean, religious. One of the things I like to say, I like, I like to break down the mysticism of religion and God. And like when the, when the Torah, the Bible says that those who bless Israel should be, will be blessed and those who curse Israel will, will be cursed. I said, listen, you don't have to be a mystic to believe that. Just look, Israel offers assistance in agriculture, in water technology, in, in natural disasters to any country that, that needs it, right? We, anyone in that Iran. supports Israel is blessed because of their support with Israel. And then when we offer it to Iran or Turkey to enemy countries, they don't take it. They are cursed. They are cursing themselves because of their anti-Israel um, uh, policy and, 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 exactly. and lifestyle. That's it. You don't have to be a mystic to see the Bible coming true. You support Israel. We are here to help you. You're against Israel. Yeah. You're not going to get the assistance we're able to give you because you're, you're denying it to yourself. Yeah. And I'll just point out, Avida, I don't think they're purely anti-Israel. I think at the core of it, there's this religious tension whereby they know that if they acknowledge what the Torah says, that there's a certain uncomfortable truths for their beliefs. You know, you know, you know the end story. If you believe in the Torah and the prophets, you know we come out of them. It's not good news for these people. So they have to deny Jewish history. They have to suppress right. Jewish history. Right. Um, and let's 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 call the spade the spade. That's what it boils down to. This is not a land dispute. Okay, the land dispute is just the front. It's it's a religious civilized clash of civilization. I'll say that now. I know you believe it, but I think we have to be honest. You cannot deal with a problem unless you acknowledge the problem. Right. It's as simple as that. Right, right. All right, Dave, it is a pleasure. There's so much more to talk about, but um, we're going to have to save it for, next the, for the next episode of Avi and Ozzy. Avi and Ozzy, and I expect before next week we get a good group going. We, we have two boards in Times Square. We're going to go global this time. Global. With, with all the money, all the donors are pouring all on us because they know the big impact. If anyone us. wants to donate to us, they'll at least somewhere. <laughs> but uh, seriously, if you have money to donate, please donate to Thor and to the people who are really suffering. And if you have any spare money and you want to donate to us, please, it's fine. But there are a lot of people in need right now. And um, please, if you can. Dave, stay home, stay healthy. Looking forward to having you back in the studio in my office. And in the meantime, we'll, we'll, we'll keep on doing the Zoom. Absolutely. Take care, Avi. Take care, everyone. Until next week. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for watching for the first episode of the Avi and Ozzy show, oh, show, signing off from the eternal and ancestral homeland of the Jewish people, the land of Israel. Shalom. Shalom.